soon after a person meets you do they learn you are Jewish? This is a question that I asked of my fifth grade students last week as we were learning about Purim. And for those of you who are not Jewish but are part of a Jewish family, we could ask how soon after a person meets you do they learn that you're part of a Jewish family? Many of the fifth grade students shared that people find out they're Jewish pretty soon after they meet them, when they become friends with someone, or when a friend asks them to hang out after school or on Sunday, and they let the friend know that they can't get together because they have Beit Sefer, or they might then explain to their friends Hebrew school. One student said that she holds back much more, and another said she proudly wears her Jewish star pendant on the outside of her clothing. This past week, as you know, we celebrated Purim, our silly and festive holiday of satire and parody. And within the humor of the day, we also can learn multiple more serious messages from the Megillah, that scroll of Esther, which tells the story uh, of Purim. Why might I ask my students the question, how soon after someone meets you do they learn that you're Jewish in connection with the Purim story? because the heroine of the story, Esther, initially hides her Jewish identity. Recapping just a bit, the king banishes his queen and holds a beauty contest to find a new one. Esther, also known as Hadassah, a Jew, enters the contest and wins, but she keeps her Jewish identity a secret, even to her beloved husband, the king. And it's only when Esther's life and the lives of her people are in jeopardy that she reveals that she is a Jew. Why are the Jews' lives in peril? Many of us know the story. Because Esther's cousin, Mordecai, will not bow down to Haman because he's Jewish. Not Haman, ha Mordecai is Jewish. And he refuses bow to bow down to Haman. And in Haman's hatred for Mordecai, that one Jew, he devises a plan to kill all the Jews. Mordecai convinces Esther to approach the king, even though the penalty is death if the king does not summon her. And as Rabbi London explained just moments ago in, in speaking to the leaders of our congregation, Mordecai urges Esther, don't imagine that you of all Jews will escape with your life by being in the king's palace. On the contrary, if you keep silent in this crisis, relief and de deliverance will come to the Jews from another quarter while your father's house will perish. And who knows? Maybe you have attained this royal position for just such a crisis. Eight Hazot. Esther goes before the king. She isn't sentenced to death, but she doesn't reveal her Jewish identity until two banquets later, when she musters the courage to reveal that she and her people are to die under the order of wicked Haman. It took Esther quite some time before she was able to share with the king, her husband, that she was Jewish. She didn't tell him the first time she approached him in the throne room, and she didn't tell him at the first banquet. It was only at the second banquet that she revealed that she was a Jew. As Mordechai had urged her, she could not remain silent. She had to speak up. Recently, I too encountered an incident in which I could not remain silent in the face of hatred. At the end of February, my husband Dave was walking the dog early in the morning and noticed along one side of a neighborhood street there were leaflets sealed in a sandwich bag with gravel at the bottom to keep the paper from blowing away. We live in Skokie near the Hillel Torah and the Hebrew Theological Seminary. Jeff, you can show that slide. This is what he found, and this is actually one of them. It says, get with the J-A-B, Jews against Briss. 
And you can see this is the back side with a QR code linked to a YouTube video of an ABC News report about a brith in which a baby dies of herpes from an oral suction in a ritual circumcision by Orthodox Jew. Another headline reads, Why Ultra-Orthodox Jewish Babies Keep Getting Herpes. Someone who doesn't know better would think that this message was coming from a group of more modern Jews, perhaps a group called Jews Against Bris. But it wasn't from Jews. It's clearly from anti-Semites sharing negative propaganda against Jews. And how do we know this? Days earlier, similar leaflets were strewn in Glenview and on the campus of the University of Illinois in Champaign, and I learned later in Park Ridge, in this same kind of packaging. Let's look at the next slide. And so we can see, actually, the, the first one is turned on its side. It, I'm a member of the North Shore Jewish Moms Facebook group, and I had seen this which also was a signal to me to say, Amy, make sure you speak up. And the first one says, every single aspect of the Biden administration is Jewish on the left side, and the right side says, every single aspect of the COVID agenda is Jewish. And the person who posts this mentions that it was her boss who found this on his Glenview uh, porch. And the, the one on the right is someone else posted saying this is what was found uh, around the campus in University of Illinois in Champaign. And that's the similar, um, every single aspect of the COVID agenda is Jewish. You can take the slides down now, thanks. Like Esther, I could not remain silent. I needed to speak up. So I reported this anti-Semitic act in multiple places. First, I went to the Skokie Police Department and said, I'd like to report this as a hate crime. Next, I filled in the online incident report from the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, on their website, and I called someone at our local regional office of the ADL. And then I hand-delivered letters to the offices of our mayor, state representative, and state senator. My state representative, Denise Wang Stoneback, called me from Springfield the next day, suggesting that I also report this incident to the Attorney General of Illinois, which I did. My state senator's staff person has since connected me with a couple members of the Asian community who have been experiencing and are combating similar hatred directed toward them, as you well know, and we're going to be meeting in a couple of weeks. A police officer called me the next day to say that they had no leads and no one else reported anything from my neighborhood. Had I not spoken up, no one would have. What more could I do? This was so much bigger than I. It, this is so much bigger than I. My ask of local politicians was that I, I want the people who did this to be held accountable for their actions. But truly what I really want is the eradication of anti-Semitism and hatred. How can we combat anti-Semitism? The staff member from my state senator, Ron Villalon's office, Vitan Hasku, also shared with me a video of a press conference which Senator Laura Fine gave with other Jewish legislators. I don't know if anyone caught that. Some people did. So these four Jewish legislators were flanked by many other colleagues of other faiths and backgrounds. And those people surrounding them communicated, we have your backs. Senator Fine had brought with her a similarly stuffed plastic bag with gravel and that had some anti-Semitic leaflet therein. And this leaflet had slightly different language targeting her and other Jewish politicians in Illinois. 
For her, this was personal. Senator Sarah Feigenholz quoted Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky. He had recently mentioned, just after the Russian bombing that struck the Holocaust Memorial landmark, Babin Yar, President Zelensky said, I am now addressing all the Jews of the world. Don't you see what's happening? That is why it is very important that millions of Jews around the world not remain silent right now. Nazism is born in silence. So shout out about killings of civilians. Shout out about the murders of Ukrainians. We must not keep silent regarding Ukraine, regarding anti-Semitism, against any threats to any minority groups. But how else can we respond to anti-Semitism and similar acts of hatred? In that same press conference, Representative Bob Morgan of Illinois' 58th District and chair of the Jewish Caucus in the House suggests increasing security for institutions of faith and culture and engaging in education in combating hate. Allison Slonim of the Simon Wiesenthal Center was invited by Representative John Carroll of the 57th District. She emphasized the importance of addressing the way social media recruits young people and foments all kinds of hatred. In the question and answer session, she said, things are different today than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago because of social media. Have you ever been on Facebook or some other social media platform and an advertisement will pop up or will be there in the margins of something you just bought or had inquired about in a search? Well, if someone has visited or clicked on a transphobia link, maybe a related racist link might appear in the next pop-up if you're interested in one kind of hatred, you might be interested in another. Stopping the social media spread is key to this mission. Rabbi Deborah Waxman, PhD, President and CEO of Reconstructing Judaism, in an article she wrote called Beyond Antisemitism, suggests multiple concrete steps steeped in Jewish values for both individuals and organizations. And one step which strongly resonates with me involves effective coalition building and public representation. This requires forming real relationships, not only with Jews, it demands that we seek out allies externally who will be there for us as we will be there for them. And I'm thinking of Beth Emmett after the Tree of Life attack here in this sanctuary with the doors open, filled to capacity, with Jews and non-Jews alike supporting us during that terrible time. I think about Esther's relationship that she had with King Ahasuerus. When she approaches him for the first time in the throne room, he doesn't subject her to the death penalty, though that was the law at the time. Besides the fact that his character is created as someone who is often buffoon-like, perhaps it's the relationship, because she is his beloved wife, and she is so dear to him. He even says to her, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half the kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. The Purim story is a satire, and one could argue that it was written in such a way as to entertain while it brings the Jews to victory. But the essence of having real relationships with people who create true friendships is not a fairy tale. I'm reminded of the time that Rabbi Jonah Pesner told the story of his presence at a poor people's campaign rally. He got up to speak, and someone nearby him in the front row began to heckle him about Israel and the Palestinians. 
And the Reverend Will Barber came next to Rabbi Pesner and put his arm around him and said, we're not here to talk about that now. Don't you dare insult my brother. I'm paraphrasing it, but this is how I remember the story as told to me by Rabbi Pesner. And so that person was stopped in their tracks because the Reverend William Barber and Rabbi Jonah Pesner had created a strong relationship, a true friendship that had each other's backs and could be there side by side. We cannot completely rid the world of Haman's and anti-Semitism, nor will we eliminate hatred completely. What we must do is build coalitions internally and externally and create real relationships. We can hold perpetrators accountable for their actions. We can increase security and increase education combating hate. And what we can do, what we must do, is speak up and not remain silent in the presence of anti-Semitism or any other bigotry, prejudice, nor hate. Kein Yeratzon. Shabbat Shalom.